Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. And nice to see you here in, in diverse parts of our beautiful world. Uh, I want to, to go in some detail in, in Turkish internal policies. And I'll start with the year 2013. As you know, in May, June uh, 2013, the first and the largest uh, democratic protests uh, took place in Istanbul, the so-called Gezi protests, and they were suppressed violently. And if somebody had some illusions about the democratic character and aspirations of the AKP uh, government, and especially uh, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he could leave these aspirations uh, immediately. That was the first thing in 2013. Uh, in 2013, again, uh, Erdogan started a charm offensive uh, directed to the Kurds, the so-called uh, Kurd Açılımı, the Kurdish opening, even sometime before that. Uh, Erdogan, the leader of uh, the PKK, was in, involved in this uh, so-called action and there were some hopes that the party which the Kurds then formed, the HDP, HDP as we call it in German, would be part of some sort of, of government. Uh, the idea was that in the elections of 2015, Erdogan hoped to get a higher rating by including the Kurds in his aspirations. Unfortunately for him, uh, the, um, the results of the elections of 2015 were quite a disappointment for him because he lost his majority in parliament. Uh, ADP, the Kurdish par uh, party, came into the uh, Grand National Assembly of Turkey, Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi, uh, and Erdogan was in a rather difficult position because if he wanted to uh, uh, form a government, he either should form a coalition government with the Kurds or go to new elections. Uh, coalition government with Kurds was almost impossible because a vast majority in the Turkish society uh, was against a, Turk a Kurdish participation in politics. So he um, changed his policy within the summer and, and autumn 2015, uh, had a extremely anti-Kurdish uh, policy and in the uh, elections of November 2015 he had then a majority. The majority he had was working with the extreme nationalist party MHP, Milli Hareket Partisi as we call it, and some uh, outreaches of them, the so-called Ülkücüler or the Grey Wolves. We know them quite well of course in Germany and elsewhere too. They formed a sort of coalition, and because of that coalition, um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan could pass his presidential uh, system through the parliament, and so he was more or less in a stable condition. Um, the thing is that <clears throat> having done so and establishing a presidential regime didn't mean that the problems ended for him because he had a very fierce opponent, um, I mean by that the Gulen movement, the preacher Gulen, who was um, uh, an ally of Mr. Erdogan, uh, was no longer his ally because uh, the Gulen movement asked, say in 2010, 2011, for participation in government, which the AKP and especially Mr. Erdogan was not ready to, to concede. Uh, so the um, relationship between the two, this Gulen movement and Mr. Erdogan's party, AKP, uh, became sour. And uh, when we were in autumn or even December 2013, the Gulen movement uh, was very forceful and very uh, yeah, impressive in a way in the intelligent area, published uh, recordings which proved quite clearly that there was mass corruptions uh, among the AKP people. And this made the relationship between the Gulen movement on the one hand and the AKP even more difficult, if not uh, almost impossible. Um, 
so when in July 2015, uh, the failed uh, military coup happened, uh, Erdogan was very quick uh, to tell the people that the Gulen movement was behind that, and not only the Gulen movement, even uh, imaginable. But at the same time, all in 20, 2050, there was an idea emanating in Turkey, which was called Mavi Vatan. Mavi Vatan means uh, uh, blue fatherland. And that was an idea of an admiral that extended by another admiral uh, in general, or in short, it meant that large parts of the Black Sea, the Aegean, and large parts uh, of the um, um, Mittelmeer were sort of, sort of part of Turkish area of interest, and this is the background for the drillings uh, which uh, um, Mr. Hosfeld mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the Blue Fatherland notion was just ref uh, only for the for the uh, seas around Turkey, but it was then rather quickly uh, extended to other areas too. And the essential part of that was that if Turkey wanted to become a big country, um, I don't want to mention the ideology at this point, uh, should have a very forceful military, and not only a military, but it should be also be capable to dictate its will on its neighbors, be it Syria, Libya, northern Iraq, and whatnot. For that purpose, the Navy was modernized. We know that Turkey has a sort of, and quite a number of modern ships now. Uh, we know, of course, these drones, uh, which uh, Mr. Hossad already mentioned, the Bayraktar drones, and uh, other things too. The interesting thing here is that by doing so, Erdogan somehow managed to reconcile two segments of society which were antagonistic before that. The one is the nationalist fraction, most represented by the military, and the religious sector, which was represented more or less by his party and groups around his party. So it was the first time in modern Turkish history that the military, uh, the defendant of the a licentic uh, republic and representatives of the religious right were unified and um, were unified and having the same ideals in foreign policy. So when it came to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, it was for them quite natural in Hypens, of course, uh, to assist um, Azerbaijan on ideological grounds, first of all, but not only on ideological grounds, uh, but also on economic grounds. Uh, as you know, uh, Turkey wants to be an energy hub for quite some time. And there is the idea that the energy flows uh, should go from east to west through Turkey. And some is already happening that way. But the plans are even, uh, high-flying, they want to include Turkmenistan in even further east, um, uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Kazakhstan and so forth in all these plans. So the interest in uh, mingling in Azerbaijani politics is not just a historic thing, but it's also economic uh, thing because uh, when Turkey becomes an energy hub, it gains, of course, enormous. Uh, not only financially, but also was prestige and, and so forth. So it was for them quite um, interesting to be part of that uh, game in Nagorno-Karabakh. Besides that, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict inflicted a sort of nationalistic wave in Turkey um, beyond the AKP and beyond the MHP. Um, being in dire straits uh, economic wise, you know, the Turkish currency is spiraling down with great speed. Uh, you could distract the people by a narrative, a nationalistic narrative, 
and such a nationalistic narrative that we are one of the uh, winners of this conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh is, um, of course, quite uh, interesting for large segments of the Turkish society as such. And this is being used in propaganda thing, which is very easy to use since the uh, most of the Turkish media are currently under the rule of the AKP and Mr. Erdogan. So dissenting um, views and theories are very difficult to propagate uh, to the masses. And so we, if you have this narrative of, we want to help our brother in the East, so you can sell that policy quite easily and quite uh, successfully, to be say. By the way, um, recently we had a program on Deutschlandfunk, it's a very known uh, radio station here in Germany, very popular and uh, very solid. And they talk to uh, exclusively to Turkish experts about their ideas concerning Nagorno-Karabakh. And some of them said, well, look, this is a high t his historic um, thing for us because America is occupied with elections. Europe is doing nothing as always. Russia has its own problem, so we can do our job now. And he openly said, well, why not? We can go through Kapan and reach our brethren uh, in Azerbaijan. And this, again, is, as we know, uh, an old dream in Turkey and even in Ottoman times. So uh, connecting both countries uh, together if they get uh, the southern part of Armenia off Armenia, then this um, dream can be become reality. But I want to mention one other country which is also involved in this thing, which was never so far not mentioned, that is the Islamic Republic of Iran, as you know. Um, Russia is, first of all, well, I agree with you, Mr. Hosfer, they some sort of deal may come out of that. But I don't think that Russia will concede uh, that the southern part of Armenia will be given uh, to Azerbaijan or to Turkey, to whatever nation. And the same is true also for the Islamic Republic of Iran. And even in the 1990s, when the war was going on, then at that time, we know perfectly well that uh, Iran was not openly, but somehow assisting Armenia, at least in the early 1990s, I think 1992-93 in these essential years. So the same happens, will happen most probably if the Turkish side should try to break through Armenia, the southern part of Armenia, and get the southern part of that. Besides that, that would be a clear uh, case for Russia, because that will be a Republic of uh, Armenia, which would be assaulted in that particular case. And we know Putin said uh, a couple of days ago, two or three weeks ago, that, well, uh, if the war goes on on the soil of Azerbaijan, okay, of course, that's not, that's not our business, but we have a, uh, a deal with Armenia, not only a deal, we have to assist Armenia in case of um, uh, the assault of a third party, and a third party would be in that case uh, Turkey. By the way, as we know, uh, Russian contingent is already on the border, Armenia, uh, Nakhichevan, which is a sort of deterrent uh, for uh, interesting ideas from the Turkish side. We know that the Bayraktar is flowing along the, the Turkish Armenian border, where the, Turk the Russian base is in Gyumri and the uh, Russian side made clear that they are not interested at all in these flights. And if the Bayraktar, which is really very dangerous, as we know, and has, uh, <laughs> let me mention that too, uh, German missiles, well, they were designed by the Germans and the license was sold in 2014, something like that, uh, that came out of, out of a question of the Green Party to the German Bundestag. Um, they are coming down because the Russians have installed in Armenia and probably in Artsakh to this jamming um, things. And it is, I think, no surprise that they come down like 
like like that uh, from heavens and the the latest report we get from that region is uh, there are hardly any uh, drones now in the air because they know if they go up they will be shot down not by rockets or missiles or like that but simply by electronic jamming so um, but as everybody knows the uh, the outcome of this um, um, thing is uh, of course very uncertain uh, one should be very very careful in disseminating the tweets of mr aliyev uh, he had many times said that he had conquered this and that and this and that and uh, then at the end it was proved that it was not the case or not the case yet so uh, let's wait and see the only thing i can tell is that two hours ago i read a message of war gonzo which is a russian source quite reliable uh, more reliable than the avia pro which is not that reliable he said well the uh, force the azerbaijani forces were uh, thrown back and there were no azeris now in the in in shushi and interestingly, those that Azerbaijani soldiers they found there had always, and this is not a novelty, an Azerbaijani uh, flag with them, because every time they conquer a place or claim to have conquered a place, they raise the Azerbaijani flag and send a, a photograph by Twitter or Facebook on saying that we are already there and something like that, which is sometimes is not the case. So far, so good and. Uh, quite curious in getting your questions afterwards. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, this um, concept of neo Ottomanism already at its its beginning when it became popular, and it became popular with uh, Nechmetin Erbakan, who was, uh, you know, one of the forefathers of, of Erdogan and was, so to say, one of his teachers. Uh, he already linked neo-Ottomanism strongly to pan-Turkism. So I think that is a special thing in Turkey is that religion always has a strong ethnic, ethnic aspect. It's, it, it's because Islam is Ottoman Islam. It's it's not Arab Islam. It's Ottoman Islam. It has always linked to the traditions of these Turkic people who came from the middle from Middle Asia to the uh, to, to 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 Asia Minor and to the Balkans and then to the Arab countries. So I think it's not only a personal thing of Erdogan, but it's it's it has some popular meaning, but it has, of course, uh, a, sp a specter of different um, uh, different densities of r radicality. Um, of course, there's a difference between those people who belong to the MHP, which Rafikantian Rafi mentioned as the um, far-right nationalist party, which is in coalition with Erdogan at the moment, and more conservative, conservative Islamist people within the AKP. But I think uh, it 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 has roots in culture, not only in persons. Well, if I may add, uh, one should take into account that uh, Mr. Erdogan uh, is first of all um, is a very flexible politician. He is an opportunist, and we have shown many examples of that. Look, as I mentioned, he was ready to make a sort of Kurdish opening uh, at a time when he thought that would be uh, good for him. And when he saw that it was not good for him, to change the course and went with the extreme rights of that country. Uh, that doesn't mean that the uh, religion beliefs, religious belief of his, uh, don't play a role but uh, they certainly play a role but it is of course this opportunism uh, which uh, shapes his worldview or his policies uh, by the way he is also a man who likes power policy power policy means that he is in a way very courageous 
much more than a normal politician, for example, in the West, and tries to get the best, first of all. And when he meets <clears throat> any sort of uh, resistance, then he makes a U-turn and makes something else. I give you an example. For quite some time, when the Uyghurs in China and Xinjiang were protesting quite rightly against the Chinese and policies of the minorities, and especially by minority of the Uyghurs, um, Mr. Erdogan and Turkey in general, of course, through the mass media who gov uh, which he governs, uh, were of course first supporters of the Uyghurs. And uh, no day passed when they published something in the Turkish media about the plight of the poor Uyghurs in China and whatnot. And uh, after some time, China made a very fierce statement. Uh, saying that we have good relations trade-wise between our two countries and if you go on this way this will have serious consequences and if you don't believe or not from one day to the other there was no talk of the Uyghurs anymore in the Turkish media and nobody knows of the Uyghurs now but at a certain time they were very popular and Erdogan was a uh, fierce supporter of the Uyghurs cause. So it is, of course, the other way around also possible. Now, there is nobody who can say in the Karabakh case, please stop. Nobody says that. Uh, not the West, not the East. I don't know what Mr. Putin says, but uh, at least he has no fierce opposition, which he fears, because he is not the one who goes till the very end, to the last drop of, uh, uh, of blood. This is not his policy. Secondly, he has an internal political problem. Uh, he was, over the years, starting from two, 2002, if, as you know, he came to power in autumn 2002. They had always a majority in parliament and also in the popular vote. And this portion of popular vote is now spiraling down, quite dangerously for him. Uh, it's about 30% slightly above 30 percent the economy is in a mess so the, he has some reason uh to propagate a fierce political the, the, himself the the image of a very fierce political leader who can solve everything and this finds support as i mentioned earlier in the popular uh vote, not only popular vote, because no elections have taken place so far, uh, they are planned for 2023, um, but he gains in popularity not in the, in, in the, well, he is not still not in the 40 and 50 percent, which he had for quite some time, but, but he can hold on on the low level he has. He can't change the economy, and this is the essential thing, of course, um, but this um, warmongering is in a way uh, beneficial for him, except the ideological parts of it, which some are more ideological than Mr. Erdogan himself. Mr. Erdogan himself, as I said, is an opportunist who likes uh, to be on the gaining road. Uh, on, on, and so far in the Karabakh uh, thing is on the, the, on the gaining road, uh, but it doesn't mean that he will go on all the time on this road. Uh, if somebody tells him, well, you should stop now, uh, and otherwise you have to bear the consequences, then he is uh, this sort of politician who will give in. I'm quite sure of that. So far to that, thank you.